Uh, Facebook, uh, Jeff Moody, I'm like a bad rash. You can't get away from me. Um, what we're trying to do is get burnout breakthroughs for people. Um, burnout is real. Burnout is recoverable. Um, please avail yourself of the services, wherever that is, if that's with us, if that's with your, your local systems or your employers or yourself or a book or whatever, please get the help you need. That's always my message is get the help you need. Um, part of this series is I like to, we like to explore the various different aspects of burnout, kind of use it as a prism to look through things. And we are like so incredibly fortunate today to have really, I think one of the world leaders in pediatric urology with us today, it's Dr. Martin Coyle. He has more letters after his name than I can say in a half hour. I think I would get burned out just saying all the letters. He is an MD, FAAP, FACS, FRCS, and really just a G-R-E-A-T-G-U-Y. He's a great guy. So, so we're thrilled to have him on board today. He was um, a mentor and a colleague and a friend. And I'm just, I'm humbled to be in his presence and humbled to have him with us today. So he right now is, well, he just stepped down as the chief of pediatric urology at um, Sick Kids in Toronto, which is the premier uh, pediatric uh, hospital in the entire country of Canada, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Um, and uh, and we were just chatting before we got on the live stream that, that COVID has been kind of the best and the worst thing uh, that's happened in the last, uh, you know, probably 10 years for him. So we were just talking about that. So, so t say, tell again what you were saying about that, Marty. So it's interesting, Jeff, I think all of us who go into surgery and probably in medicine in general tend to be fixers. We're people who are always doing and hoping we can do something not only great, but something perfect, which is uh, an unattainable goal, goal for a minority and sometimes a majority of, of uh, situations. And being someone who's always been in leadership positions, I've always had to be the go-to person. I've always had to be available. I was answering 180 emails a day. And the word no was not in my vocabulary. I may have been dyslexic and it may have been on all the time rather than no. That, so, that sounds like a recipe for burnout, Marty. I'm not sure. but uh... Well, I mean, there's many things that occur. And, and I think that you know, it's recognizing what burnout is, Jeff, that, that is the key. And when you, when, when you start feeling unhappy with a situation and you try to self-diagnose and self-fix, uh, you run into problems. So in my situation, um, and again, my burnout started probably uh, 10 years ago. Uh, yeah. I, and maybe even 20 years ago, I, I think you know that uh, I lost a child, which uh, really... To, uh, you know, in the midst of the high points of my career. And it forced me to, I think, work even harder because I felt I had to prove more. Ultimately, I took a job with an endowed chair and separated from my family, even though I didn't separate from them, uh, you know, maritally. It was uh, uh, a physical distancing to take this new position. But then I had a, a physical disability. I slipped in the cafeteria tore my quadriceps, uh, didn't walk normally, still don't walk normally, as a matter of fact, put on 45 pounds, lot of, lost a lot of self-esteem, and didn't know whether I'd be able to practice again. And um, you start losing confidence in yourself. So I think that when I look at my point of where my burnout really started, it, it, it may have been triggered a little bit by my son's death, but I think uh, losing my physical ability and becoming... Right dependent on others was really um, something that hit home. And uh, moving to Toronto, I thought I was going to move to a different system where I didn't need to be the boss because I originally came here not to be the chief. <laughs> uh, ultimately, within two years, I was the chief again. Um, and things did, haven't turned out the way I'd hoped they would here. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the Canadian system. I'm coming from the U.S. system. And I was forced to adapt. And I think the clarity of my role here was not what it had been in previous places. And whereas um, you were certainly responsible for everything under your leadership, you never got any congratulations or thank you. And yeah. I think when you're already feeling a little bit badly about yourself <laughs> mentally and you don't get any kudos from elsewhere, 
um, it really starts to ask you who you are. So and, again, and, and maybe why you're doing, why you're putting your all your energy and your life and your time into something. You know, it, is this really worth it? Well, you and I were talking that uh, I'm not I'm not going to compare the Canadian and American healthcare systems. That's not the point of this. But I was used to a system where, at least in my practice, I was very involved with my colleagues. I felt there was a sense of community uh, with referring physicians, with people like you who uh, I shared patients with in, in, in their medical care. Uh, and at the same time, I knew families and my patients. I could walk into a movie theater or a grocery store and kids yeah. would run up to me and say, thank you. Yeah. In Canada, that, that was in the U.S.? That was when you were in the U.S.? That was in the U.S. Coming to Canada, we see volumes of patients. So if you think of us, I'm living in a city the size of Chicago, um, where there's only one children's hospital, not multiple. There's only one urology residency program. And we take care of 100% of the pediatric patients from bedwetters all the way to cancer care and kidney transplants. So we have volumes that are unheard of in the United States that we have to see, and they're coming from all over the province. Sometimes uh, we're the Quaternary Care Center for Canada. So a little, from exactly the whole country. Well, so we, we, we have quite a load and quite a responsibility. And unfortunately, there's not the same congeniality. It's not that we're that like you and I could talk on the phone in Colorado, uh, we could see each other in meetings. Here, there's not that face-to-face -face recognition. And if I see a patient in my clinic, it doesn't mean I'll be the doctor seeing him the next clinic or the clinic after. Or well, if they're doing their sur surgery, maybe, unless it's something specific, you know, that you specialized in. Yes, yes. So my relationship and that that's, I think it was an ego boost for me in a way to be sort of friendly with people yeah, I lost that here. The contact, um, even though we're in we're a non-competitive fiscal system, it still is a very competitive academic system, and and that can sometimes be just as bad with backstabbing as mm -hmm. uh, a fiscal jealousies uh, become. So, do you, so, do you feel that? Um, I mean, I I just kind of feel like there's the monetary rewards for what we do, and then there's kind of the psychic rewards. And I feel like for me, it's like a compliment from a patient, like keeps me going for a, for a month, you know? So it is, it's, I think those are very strong motivators for me. And I feel like you're probably the same way. Um, it, it's just, it's important. And then if you're maybe in a place where you're not getting that, then clearly that's like that uh, to me, that like lights the, 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 the candle or the, the match on, on the burnout, you know? And then you're like, God, I'm working really hard. And you know, I, I don't know, you, you tell me kind of what, if that was also made a little bit of a, Again, I think those of us who go into surgery and we may be a different, a little bit different than people with other specialties because we get immediate gratification for many of the things we do. I mean, you, you're an expert in uh, urolithiasis with stones. And uh, when you take out a kidney stone and the patient's pain goes away. I'm the hero. You're the hero, right? Yep. And um, I must admit that I still get emails, cards from patients from from California, from uh, Colorado, from Washington State, who thanked me for the care that they received. The word thank you has been foreign to me here. Mm -hmm. and, and whereas we, we have very uh, little system support, less personnel to, to block things in a way, um, every complaint comes directly to us because our patients have our emails. Mm -hmm. So we have waiting times right now uh, because of COVID, we have over 800 kids waiting to have testicles brought down, yes. over 400 uh, waiting for hypospadia surgery, and families understandably want an answer. But I'm not. I'm not running the system. I can't be responsible for everything. So it puts a lot of pressure on an individual when there's no support around them, and you're the go-to person, but don't have the tools to fix it. Yeah, like they kind of left you on an island where they're like, hey, um, there's a ton of demand and there's no support. Uh, good luck. See you later. You know, like that's right. Here's your boat. But guess what? No paddle. And there's yeah. a yeah, Exactly. And you're only five miles from shore and the currents go in the other direction. You know, exactly. Oh, man, look, at great, look at those great whites, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what, what do you um, 
do you feel like either systemically or even even within your own department, do you feel like there are mechanisms to help with burnout or is it even an acknowledge or I guess I kind of like burnout international like so it's, it's interesting yeah. Jeff I didn't know what burnout was until I was burned out because I felt I was depressed yeah. so I went to a psychiatrist I mean because I I had never felt like that before and she said you're not depressed you don't need medication do you know what burnout is and then of course like every other obsessive compulsive surgeon you read every book and go online and you figure oh my god and then you, then you realize who Tate Shanafeld is and you start reading everything that he's written yep. and you figure, oh my God, the Mayo Clinic must be the best place in the world and now Stanford is rewarded because he's moved there. Uh, the reality is I think what you have to, what people who are burning out or burned out have to recognize is it's very individual. You may have reacted very differently than I did and your needs and support may therefore may be uh, very different. And everybody talks about resilience, um, you know, and, and I think people have to understand resilience is not an armor. It's not, you have your inner protection to begin with. The key is when that armor has been penetrated, your body has already been impacted. How do you heal and bounce back? So the problem is if there's a systemic issue around you, you could be the strongest, most resilient person in the world and have all the support from your family, your friends, your colleagues. But if you have that continued trauma, yeah. the stress or whatever you wanna look as the inciting issue, you, it's impossible even for the strongest person to completely uh, go back to normal. Yeah, I always think of resilience kind of in two, well, I, I do think there is a small component to resilience. Um, but number one, true or false, do you feel like all doctors are, are is resilient? I'm like, like, I, like I'm on call and I've got three cases and then a torsion comes in and I'm like, and I'm like switching gears and I'm like, and I, you handle it all. And, and you're like, like, and then, okay, next. So like that one's done next 20 seconds later, you've moved on to the next thing. I'm like, all, all we are is resilient. Number yeah. one, number two, in, in my book, I make this reference, but I'm like, sometimes I feel like resiliency training is like, can I, can you want some barbecue stuff, you know, sauce on that kind of stool sandwich that I'm, you know, you know, selling you? Like the, the problem is not the sauce. The problem is the sandwich. You know, we need to change what's on the menu, you know, so to speak. And um, and I do I, I, I worry that with kind of the corporatization of medicine, you know, in the U.S. and in Canada, and you're in a large system, obviously, that. Again, it's only driven, it becomes more driven by the metrics and the numbers. And because that's the only thing that can be measured is, is the financial numbers. But it's like, what other, what other industry or business in the world would they expect you to work 10, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours a day and, and then just keep more on you? I'm like, they're like in any other business in the world, they'd be like, well, let's get you some software tools. Let's get you a team. Like we need consultants. I'm like, that's like not even, I feel like that's not even a discussion in well, medicine. It, it isn't a discussion because if, uh, especially when you work within a, a big conglomerate uh, or a big system like I do, where you're, you're faceless. Uh, yes. Nameless. You're a very tiny cog in a gigantic machine. You know, well, so. The reality is, guess what? If they set the bar higher and I make it, they're going to say, well, he made it. So let's set the bar even higher. And that's what I think has happened is, you know, you lose one person from the worst workforce because of budget. And they say, well, let's not replace them. These guys can uh, pick up the slack. They, yeah, they can just make it up. Yeah. yeah. You know. And you know what? I'm 150 years old now. I mean, I can't pick up the slack the way I used to. And, and nor should you be expected. And that's the, that's, I guess my, my concern or my thought is that the, because of our training and because of historically the way things have worked, it's like, we, I think we are perceived as having an infinite ability to continue to ramp up. You know, like I'm seeing triple the number of patients that I saw 20 years ago to make the same amount of money. And not that the money is the issue, but it's like the system keeps expecting you to do more with the same or get paid less for the same or, you know, do, do more with in, insufficient resources. And, and we always have to make up the difference. It always comes out of our hide, our life, our psyche, you know, I guess. Well, the other thing too, Jeff, I think we have to realize that uh, when the Institute of Medicine uh, 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 printed to Air as Human in 
1999, the concept was we really have to look at the big picture systems. And we have to realize, like um, Reasoner, uh, Reason said, is it's a Swiss whole problem that uh, every patient is a potential uh, avenue for error. And if the holes in the Swiss cheese line up, uh, uh, severe errors can occur. So the reality, unfortunately, is still you as the, the doctor in what we consider to be highly reliable organizations are still held to blame rather than being in what we term a just culture where it's really the system. And instead of just always pointing the finger on an individual, we continue to blame the individual and not and disregard and don't look for a fix within the system. Yeah, it, the, the whole captain of the ship, you know, kind of mentality, which, you know, I, I get that in the operating room, but it's like, again, like you pointed out, there are systemic factors that are really beyond my control or beyond my purview that have like got us to the point where now there's a, you know, a significant error or a significant problem. Absolutely. But yet we're still held responsible. Like, I don't, I don't know how much malpractice insurance the, uh, the, uh, you know, CEO of the company, you know, or of your system is, or your hospital is carrying probably none, you know, because mm -hmm. they know they've shifted all the risk and the blame to us. Um, what do you feel like was your process for getting out of where you were or getting back to the value, things that you value in your life? I know you're a, you're a lifelong learner. Well, you're on your like 55th uh, master's, I think now. And, uh, uh, but is that kind of where you've kind of diverted your energy? Like if I can't get that psychic, you know, return from my relationships with patients and colleagues, I, I'm going to turn it to learning and writing and teaching, I guess. Yeah. So I think, Jeff, that I wasn't ready to retire. Okay. I, I wasn't really to give, give up because I think in a way I was looking at giving up in retirement as being uh, uh, equal in meaning, which isn't necessarily true either. Uh, now that I'm older, I'm ready to retire, to be quite frank with you. But, but uh, what did I do? So I did the, everything the self-help book said. I started to meditate. I did yoga. I did this, that, and the other. But I realized that, you know, I'm used to working an 18 to 20-hour day. I've, I've never slept more than four to six hours at a time and probably never will learn how to sleep in. That's just not part of my persona. And I get it from my dad, who slept two hours a night. So... So the reality, a sloth in comparison. You know? Yeah. So the reality is, I, I think I'm an adrenaline junkie. I mean, I, I love doing, I love trying something new. I love challenges. And, uh, you know, prior, prior to recognizing my situation, but realizing I wasn't impacting the system the way I had hoped here, uh, I did go back uh, to gain further education. Like you said, I, I got a master's of science and quality improvement um, and patient safety, which I realized had been my strength and what I looked at for so many years, but didn't have a name for it. Right. That allowed me to change my focus because I wasn't getting my joie de vivre as, uh, as you and I talked about before from, from patient contact and from being the doctor I used to be, but I loved mentoring. I loved stimulating. I loved getting students, whether they're medical students, any other students to ask the questions, why? Why do we do what we do? Why does our culture do this? Because right. I think the only way we change a culture or a system is to understand it and to question it. Absolutely. And so that for me was a big step. Uh, I've stayed on the faculty there. I've written quite a bit about it. I'm an editor of uh, a section in one of the journals based on quality improvement and patient safety. So it has been um, something that keeps me going and keeps me interested in coming to work every day. Um, and, and I guess to a certain extent, sorry to interrupt, but to a certain extent, do you also feel like you're maybe trying to work within the system to change the system, I guess? No, I think uh, I know uh, I can't fight City Hall, okay? And, and it's too frustrating for me to do that. But if I can galvanize others, and have them question things rather than accepting inherent culture and saying, we, we do this because this is the way we do it. Right. Which is, to me, it, it drives me insane to this day. Um, uh, I think that I've, I've, it's like being a father. You, right. you, you're teaching your children to hopefully do something better than the way you did it. Right. They want them to be better. 
but without questioning and just accepting. I mean, look at the way you and I trained. You, you trained 10 years after I did. I was obsolete as a general urologist five years after I graduated. I could not practice general urology today. I haven't a clue how to do 90% of what you do in your practice, okay? I can shake hands and I can smile because fortunately most people don't need an operation. But technically, I'm obsolete. Sure, I could learn it, but it's not worth it. Yeah. So that being said, my first step uh, after recognition was changing my focus and realizing that it's cheap at that time. I could change my focus because I ran the department. So that's being a dictator in a way, but it allowed me to just shuffle what I did. When my term as chief was up for renewal, I just said to myself, you know what? I can't change it. I can't continue to be in a position where I'm the one responsible for everything and all I'm getting is the headaches. I'm not getting the satisfaction. And, you know, again, it's my ego in, in that uh, situation too. And I stepped down as chief uh, just under a year ago. My number of emails every day has dropped from about 180 a day to 60 a day. My number of calls, the number of angry letters and things I have to answer, I don't get anymore. So the reality, um, that to me, you know, I wondered what, what it would be like to not be the chief. I tried it for two years before, it was fine, but you know, now it's you, one of my junior faculty is my boss and, it, and it's been easy. I mean, it's, it's been a piece of cake because again, my focus has changed and my ability to now say no has also enhanced. You know, uh, one of my buddies, uh, Bill Urey, wrote a book called Getting to Yes, and uh, he's probably one of the great leaders in negotiation uh, um, uh, worldwide. Man. Uh, but I, I was always trying to get to yes. I was always trying to get to, if not a compromise, certainly win. I learned how to negotiate. Um, but now I'm in a position where, you know what, if I don't want to do it, I'm saying no. For the yeah. first time in my life, I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about, you know what, life is short. I want to be a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather with the time I have left. I've done all the doctoring I can. I'm not going to win a Nobel Prize. I'm not going to change anything I do dramatically. And when I'm dead, nobody's going to remember anything I've done. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the, the epitaph that everybody quotes is nobody's going to say that he could have worked harder. Yeah, true. Although, okay, I think every single patient you ever helped or operated on, they'll remember and their families remember, okay? You were like the most gigantic boulder that like dropped into a, uh, a pond. And I think the ripples you've created, you have to give yourself credit for that. And that's, that's what I think of. And that's what I especially think of for you because you're, you've been such a giant in urology and pediatric urology and for like hundreds of thousands of people's lives. So please give yourself that credit. I think you deserve it. You should take it. You should own it. You should like write it down on a piece of paper on your computer. So you look at it every day. You totally deserve it. Um, I, I think everyone here in Colorado is forever indebted to you. And I'm personally am too, because you were a, a friend and a mentor. And I think you don't underestimate those impacts that you make on people. But again, so. those are people who I've gotten to know too. And, and I, that my, uh, I must admit, Jeff, that I, I feel that maybe my personality is similar to yours as we're outgoing people. And we tend, we've tended to attract a lot of uh, what I would call colleagues who have become friends as a result. Right. And we're very fortunate in that respect. Okay. We also have wonderful wives and families. So we're very fortunate, even more fortunate to have that. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Question for you. Um, switching gears a little bit, do you feel since the system, I, I, they talk about, you know, burnout, there's personal issues, there's systemic issues. Um, do you feel there is any impetus for systemic and systemic approach to burnout or that is like not even on a burner or even in the kitchen of where the stove exists and where you, where you are practicing? You know, it's funny. There's a, terrific book that one of my colleagues at McGill uh, and my current masters has recommended to me called the wellness syndrome. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've read it by Cedar Spicer. It's really clever. It's, you would love it. Okay. okay. 
I, I highly recommend it. But, you know, I think that the first thing that people do is they tend to react and they, and they put window dressing on. So institutions will tend to support a wellness officer. Uh, our institution has now started a peer support program, and I'm part of that. And I think, you know, it is helpful, but it's not necessary. And it, even though it's supposed to be anonymous, you know, it's like everything else. Elevator talk happens, and and uh, people know what's going on. We're a small community. It's a small town, and gossip happens. So I think there, some people are able to, to work it out. Some people can read a book. Some people can go to a shrink. Some people can go to peer support. And you really have to decide what works best for you. Okay, you can't you can't say one size fits all. And, uh, you know, some people may have a depressive component as well, which I think you have to make sure that you don't have any other uh, issues that require uh, investigation or intervention. And, and I think that that's paramount is to make sure that you're, that you're following the right track. And, and, if you, and if meditation doesn't help or yoga doesn't help or juggling or uh, t- taking a bath every night, um, then, then you have to explore something else. And, and I, I, I think, you know, regaining balance is probably the best analogy that I can say is that something has happened to get rid of your equilibrium, okay? And most of it is a reaction to the system, to the stress of the system. It's, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Right? It means this is how you've reacted. And we know statistically that half of our colleagues or more uh, are suffering from the same issues to different degrees. So you're not looking in the mirror uh, all the time and just seeing yourself, you're seeing the people around you. And, and one of the things that I think is really helpful is when you see a colleague and you can clearly see the signs around them is not to tell them what to do, but just to say, you know, I'm here to listen. I mean, you know, you wanna go grab coffee, but not push them, okay? Right. I don't think that, again, people who try to sell you something as being a right way. I, I, I do think a number of great points you made there. The, I think it, we, we kind of, I'm kind of joking with myself about this, but like it's a 12 step program. The first step is realizing you have a problem. And I don't think you telling me that I have a problem, that first thing I'll do is like, like no, I'm fine. Especially if I'm a surgeon. I'm like, what are you talking about? I, I'm, I got it handled. I'm Superman, my cape is on you know, like, don't worry about me, you know, until like you're throwing stuff in the OR and, you know, you have some negative outcomes, you know, negative interactions with colleagues and friends and family and patients. So it's like, it's definitely, it's something where I think people have to tumble to it themselves. And I do think you're correct. Everybody presents a little differently. Some people get sad. Some people get quiet. Some people get blue. Some people commit suicide. Um, So clearly like that's my big impetus for doing this is that I, I feel like we both have gotten through this, this journey and let's help other people pick up wherever they are in that journey. Let's try to do what we can to get them better. Um, it's the reason for the website, the book, you know, all, all this stuff that I'm doing is, is to help people get better and re- realize that it's, it, it's okay to be a human being. It's okay to, you know, you, you're not a super man or super woman and, and you can get better. Um, <laughs> the other point you made is that I, I do think there's a lot of, at least I think if the fashionability, if that's a word, uh, uh, of, of wellness is a thing now and people are at least acknowledging it either verbally, but not maybe with a budget. I know there are hospital systems we interact with that have a, you know, they have a wellness person, wellness, you know, officer, and that person has no budget, right. you know, or that department has no budget to actually do anything. I'm like, and I, I, we always appreciate the, Doctor Appreciation Day and those types of things. I'm like, but you know what? Can you hire me a scribe or a, or a NP or a PA to help me get the work done? I'm like, I appreciate that you appreciate me, but it doesn't make my job or my life any better. This is a systemic problem. I can't round on 30 patients in the morning and then expect it to be 60 patients in the office. Like, there's not enough hours in the day. It's a it's a math problem. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not my problem, but then it becomes my problem because of the demands. And so, like absolutely let's let's understand that there are personal issues or I, I think burnout is a result not a cause so you know this is a result of everything that's happening to you but 
you know, and you can do things to help yourself, but let's also fix the systemic parts too. All the, oh, you know, the data, all the data says you need to do both. You need to fix personal things, but you need to fix the systemic things that you can, or maybe, you know, if you can't, then maybe you need a different system. Right. So. Oh, Marty, I just, I, I want to be super respectful of your time. Um, we're, we, we've had a great conversation. Um, one of the great, all-time great uro pediatric urologists, probably in the history of the world, really, just saying, you know, probably top three, maybe top three, top four. Um, and I was an all-star goalie in hockey, though. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but don't take one, you know, to the privates, okay? Then you'll, right. you'll have to be an adult urologist to pick that. So. <laughs> All right. So jeffmoody.com. Um, there's a book there. The doctor's burned out. Uh, Physicians Guide to Recovery. That's my book. Um, there's a course you can sign up for. Um, we, you can sign up for the live streams. I want to make sure you get the information you need. We have a weekly email uh, blast that we send out. So just get the help you need, please. Just wherever that is. And contact us if we can help you contact Marty, but don't email him. He's got enough emails. So just maybe like send him a nice letter, a handwritten letter, maybe that you say thank you a lot. And that would you probably appreciate that. I like bourbon um, and scotch too, if people like to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in any event, um, jeffmoody.com, Marty, Mar Martin Coyle, FRCS, uh, doctor, pediatric urologist, great guy. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Anytime you want me back, I'm there for you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. All the best, Jeff.